Well, hello, everyone. Um, so though I am presenting this presentation, I want to make sure that I mention that the work described here is a collaborative effort of many, many people, um, especially my coworkers, Rochelle Stiles and Jared Willis, whose work and results are included in this presentation. And additionally, I wanted to mention that a lot of the data I'm going to be sharing came from Mary Toothman at UC Santa Barbara in a collaborative effort that we worked with. So I wanted to give her a quick shout out as well. In terms of the work that we're doing here at the San Francisco Zoo, we currently head start four species of amphibians, one reptile, and one invertebrate for release. And today I'm going to be focusing on the yellow-legged frogs, the two species of yellow-legged frogs, and the California red-legged frog. Both Ranocieri, the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog, and Ranomuscosa, the southern mountain yellow-legged frogs, are part of our conservation focus. But by far, we work more with the Sierra Nevada species, and so that will be the main focus of the discussion today. The mountain yellow -legged frogs are a species complex made up of two species, the Sierra Nevada yellow -legged frog and the southern mountain yellow -legged frog. Both are medium-sized medium randed frogs inhabiting lakes, ponds, marshes, streams, and elevations below 3,600 meters. The Ranocieri is endemic to the northern, southern, uh, sorry, the northern central Sierra Nevada, while the southern mountain yellow -legged frog is more of southern Nevada in the transverse ranges. But both populations are mostly found now on national park and national forest lands. They used to be extremely abundant in aquatic ecosystems, but have undergone severe declines. As you can see here, almost 93% decline for the northern and 96% decline for the southern species. Just some quick background on the species. The Sierra Nevada yellow frogs were once the most abundant vertebrate at high elevation in the Sierras, and populations could be super dense, um, about 10 individuals per meter on the shoreline and over 10,000 individuals per site at some locations. Originally, fish was seen as the main threat with um, the initial decline of the species being blamed on introduced rainbow trout, golden trout, brook trout, and brown trout that are all known to predate on different life stages of mountain yellow-legged frogs. For many decades, <laughs> these species were dropped, um, trout were reared to hatcheries and dropped by plane into even remote areas to provide remote recreational activities. And unfortunately, this caused many problems in the backcountry. And although eventually these were halted in the national parks, it still continued in large areas of national forests. Um, and unfortunately, already populations had started to decline before these were ceased in some areas. Just to give you an idea of the impact that this had on the species, you can see in gray that as the non-native fish were, were removed, the, the gray shows the amount of non-native fish removed. And you can see following that, the mountain yellow frog population started to increase. So the impact of the fish was pretty severe. And with the removal of large amounts of those fish, the mountain yellow frogs were able to come back. Now, this was in the late, late 1900s and early 2000s. And you can see that there were large amounts of what we thought were positive actions going forward for this species. And as things were improving on the landscape, suddenly another threat came, and that was chytridiomycosis, which first appeared in this area of Sequoia and Kings Canyon in 2006. Chytrid is now the major cause of loss of populations for the species. We think that it first appeared in California in the early 1960s and is now widespread across the state. All populations of both species of yellow-legged frogs are infected with BD throughout most of their range. And just to give you an example, in Yosemite National Park, more than 80% of all Rana Sierra or, Southern, or Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frogs tested positive for BD recently. Um, this species is highly susceptible. And though Vance Vredenberg, who was one of the people who did a lot of the non-native trout removal initially, he also was one of the first people to witness this decline due to chytrid and document the metapopulation collapse. And you can see on the right side some of his data where he shows three metapopulations representing about 80 populations, small populations of frogs that had eventual declines during his research period from 1996 to 2008, where large populations suddenly and dramatically dropped once BD was present. 
the good news is that though populations are in decline, there is a lot of pristine habitat out there. There's lots of potential for the species to be recovered. And there's still a lot of work underway to remove non-native trout monitor and remove non-native bullfrogs in areas where they're a threat and restore damaged habitat in preparation for the return of yellow-legged frogs. In addition, both species were listed as endangered in 2014, which provides them with lots of potential protections. I'm also going to be talking about California red-legged frogs later on, so I want to give you a little background on them. The California red-legged frog is endemic to California and Baja, California, Mexico, and is known at elevational ranges slightly lower, more close to sea level and up to about 1500 meters. The species has been extir extirpated from about 70% of its former range and is now primarily found in coastal drainages in California and into Northern Baja. It's the largest native frog to the Western United States and recently became the California state amphibian. So it's very near and dear to many people's hearts in the state of California. It was federally listed as a threatened species in 2002. At the time, Kittred was mentioned as a possible threat, but was not listed as a decline because at that time, not a lot was known about Kittred and the impacts on amphibians. But looking at museum specimens, many researchers are confirming that BD has been in samples for a very long time and likely was a player in the decline of the species. And it has impacts that we'll be discussing a little bit later on in the presentation. So thinking about head starting at AZI, I know people have talked about this before, but just to provide a little bit on the impact that head starting can have on conservation of amphibians, head starting is the process of taking eggs from the wild, caring for tadpoles through metamorphosis and releasing juveniles or adults. And if we use an example from California red-legged frogs, if you think about the phases of the animal moving from egg, where you can start with an egg mass of about 2,500, with a 90% survival of tadpoles, you'll get 2250 tadpoles potentially, but then you have a big decline in many species from tadpole to juvenile with sometimes as low as 1% surviving, which would provide 10 animals, leaving you then with some mortality of juveniles to only about two adults. In head starting, we take on those two really vulnerable stages of the frog development and rear more animals from those egg masses than would naturally be found in the wild, increasing those numbers significantly. If we put those numbers back in, you can see that from an egg mass of 2,500, we could rear over 15 to 1,600 animals with that single egg mass. And what we found was actually using our numbers, we received 1,700 eggs of red-legged frogs. And through this process, did find that we were able to achieve slightly higher than the expected of 1,072 animals, releasing just over 1,080 animals when we did our release. So head starting can be a significant contribution to conservation in the wild when worked with our collaborators and partners in the field. I'm going to focus today on two aspects of the research we're doing at San Francisco Zoo, disease and behavior. And first, I want to talk a little bit about our work to understand the response of frogs to chytrid. And later, we'll talk a little bit about the behavior and how that plays into it. But by understanding disease and the frog's response to it, we can better prepare our frogs to face what they, the disease that they'll encounter in the wild and hopefully increase their success of survival and reproduction in the wild. So to understand sort of where this all, where all of our research sort of started, you have to understand the difference between the different threats and the different development of the frog populations in the wild. So first we have to understand why some wild populations are surviving and others are not. So as you know, BD has been around in the Sierras for a long time and though we didn't know about its existence until 1998, many first declines probably went undetect undetected. And especially it seems like this was in the northern part of the Sierras. As you can see from this map, there are a lot of populations of frogs still existing in the northern Sierras but they're all infected with BD. So these populations may be stable and the populations may range from a few hundred to tens of individuals reproducing, but they have 100% prevalence in all life stages. So infection intensities seem to be low in adults, but, and so those adults may gain and lose infections in one season, but mortality in all the other life stages is very high. 
especially in metamorphs and subadults, that can carry high, high loads and often succumb to BD infection within that season that they metamorph. Tadpoles, in addition, can carry very high loads. It doesn't seem to kill the tadpoles, but they spend two to four years as a tadpole under ice and snow in these high elevation lakes. And oftentimes they just provide a constant reservoir of BD in those infected populations. Now, if we think about naive populations, which is mostly what we have in the southern, southern Sierra Nevada, um, popula some populations have not yet been invaded with BD or are just slowly now becoming infected with BD. And we've gotten to witness the wave of BD moving through these populations. Unfortunately, it, at one point it was hard to, from what I hear, it's hard to go to these lakes and not step on frogs practically. There were so many of them along the edge of these lakes. But eventually these populations decline over just a few years as BD comes in and an initial outbreak happens. During outbreaks, there's 100% of the animals are infected, especially the adults, and invariably the high mortality comes to all individuals except tadpoles. Unfortunately, then those tadpoles will metamorphose and become infected with chytridomycosis and die off, and then you have these mortalities of an entire population. So when you think about the outcomes of infection, you have the same, the same two combined factors, frogs and BD, and yet you get these really different impacts where you get small infected stable populations, large uninfected susceptible populations, and our goal is that some of these populations will survive. So two papers came out in 2010 that looked at disease dynamics on these frogs. And the most important things to come out of these papers and that kind of impacts what we're going to talk about today is the focus on persisting populations and the impact of these, these persisting populations. And so if you look at the left-hand side, you'll see that, you, that these adults carry loads one order of magnitude below the lethal threshold. So where the hatch mark is, is kind of gives you an idea, the red and black hatch mark shows you an idea of where these animals are in terms of swabs that came back above a thousand, which is still below the um, kind of more infected aspect of it. Um, in persistent populations, this translates to high survival in adults, as I mentioned, and low levels of recruitment as metamorphs succumb. And on the right, you can see that if you follow five individuals over a five-year period in a persistent population, they gain and lose an infection as they're captured and swabbed, and their loads never seem to get significantly high. They never get close to the threshold where we would consider them to be um, impacted negatively. In a companion paper that also came out that same year, when an area where BD had recently invaded a population, you can see that the declines began in these eight populations as soon as the zoospore load hit 10,000. 10,000 is about 10 times higher than what we saw in persisting frogs, and that seems to be a threshold where there's a point of no return for these wild populations. And so basically, if a mountain legged frog has an infection intensity above 10,000 zoospores, without any intervention, they will die. So when you take a look at all this data from the field, and thanks to Mary Toothman and her lab at UC Santa Barbara, or Sherry Briggs Lab in Santa Barbara, um, and you take all this data that they compiled, looking at adults in populations that experienced these types of infections, you can see that there's this red line again of point of no return. And animals that the major population past that line of point, point return are extirpated, and those that did not quite reach that line persist, are persisting in the field. <coughs> so it's becoming more and more common that you'll see some populations persisting with the disease. Um, this trend towards high adult survival and low recruitment in persisting populations has been observed repeatedly and gives us this idea that if a froglet can undergo metamorphosis, the suppression of the immune system necessary that happens during tissue rearrangement seems to also suppress their ability to fight off a BD infection. But if they can survive through metamorphosis, then they probably will develop an immune response. And so that's sort of become our goal as we look at these animals to try to figure out how can we, how can we make that happen. So there's a lot of work occurring in the Sierra Nevada. In the north, again, we have these small po persistent populations that are, but, that are stable, persisting, but can be very susceptible to stochastic events. So for example, this winter we had an incredibly high precipitation. It covered lakes for a really long time. 
and many populations probably did not have time to come out, emerge, breed, and feed. And so either they skipped the breeding season or maybe some of them did not even survive because they didn't have time enough to put on weight between the snow events that happened. In the south, we have a lot of naive populations that we need to plan for when BD invades and are being constantly monitored by biologists in the field. And then we also have all these extinct lakes that we wish to repopulate and hopefully in time place frogs back on the landscape. But in all these cases, we, we I bring myself into this, but all the people that were planning for what to do when, with these populations kind of had to sit down and consider whether to rescue, to reintroduce, to translocate, or to captively rear and try to release back into the wild. So looking at all these different impacts on the frogs and armed with the knowledge that had come out of all this research done in 2010 and before, UC Santa Barbara decided to look at the most obvious question and if there's a chance that you can infect a mountain legged frog with BD and clear the infection, will it then resist a subsequent infection? So that was kind of the one of the big questions that they wanted to ask. And what they did is they created a research project and I'm going to give you a little background because this impacts directly onto the project that we're working on. They basically took naive frogs collected from the wild as eggs and some uninfected tadpoles and split them into two groups, a control group and a recent infection group. They exposed them to either a sham, which was um, an inoculation that consisted of the same volume of liquid as the zoospores, but without the actual zoospores, and then one infected group. And they allowed the animals to build up a infection for 21 days and then treated them with itraconazole. Then about a month later, they brought in a third group of frogs. Oops, sorry. <laughs> they brought in a third group of frogs that were from the same cohort but had been used in a prior infection months ago, up to six months or even longer prior, and, um, and used them to compare the infection intensities to the recent infection frogs to see if there was any difference when they re-exposed them. And they, what they did, and they also infected the control animals to make sure that the culture they were using was actually virulent. So they exposed all of them, even the ones that previously had not been exposed, and measured their survival and BD loads. And what they found out was really interesting. Only about one in 20 of the recently infected frogs became infected, and only four out of 10 of the frogs that had been infected months and months before were infected. And this really was kind of eye-opening because it meant that something had changed with all those animals in the time that they had been infected to the time when they were reinfected. And interestingly, if you look at the same data from before, looking just at the experimental animals that became infected during the second inoculation period of the experiment and compare those to what we see in the wild populations that we had seen before, you can see that naive animals carried loads similar to what you see during an outbreak whereas animals who had previously been exposed six months before carried sublethal loads like you see in persisting populations. So they look very, very similar and um, provided a really interesting opportunity at the San Francisco Zoo for us to take it to the next level and think about this as an immun immunization tool for reintroductions. So here at the zoo, animals are being reared to head start for reintroducing populations. And each cohort of animals is being infected here in our lab and cleared before they become um, fully infected, like to the point of no return. And based on previous experiments, we're thinking that this will prep them for eventual release. We are working in a, very, in a variety of places, but what I'm going to be speaking about today is our work in Lake Tahoe Desolation Wilderness Area and El Dorado National Forest. Our source population is um, where the blow up of the map is to the left at Rivendale Pond, which is in El Dorado National Forest. And the translocation release sites are in Desolation Wilderness on the right of the map on the Lake Tahoe area. The distance isn't very far, it's only a few kilometers, but it's not an easy area for the frogs to move from. There's an elevation rise and um, it's, it's a very difficult habitat. So there didn't seem to be any natural recruitment from Rivendell Pond, which was a persisting population, to these new sites that had recently been um, become fish free and were waiting for frogs to come in. So really quickly, um, our mountain yellowed frog project here at the zoo has three main goals. Besides working with our partners, we are 
providing emergency salvage of frog populations that are at risk of localized extinction, or captive rearing, not breeding, but rearing for reintroduction projects in the Sierras, and experimenting with the acquired immune treatment to see if we can minimize the impact of the pathogen on animals that we're releasing. The decision-making process is is a process. We don't do this in a vacuum. We have an annual meeting to provide updates on projects and discuss programs every fall with state and federal agencies as well as all of our partner institutions. Then we have a second meeting in late winter to decide what projects are pursued by the zoo collaboratives, how many frogs per institution, and what the priorities are based on what happened the year before, changes in populations, BD moving in, etc. Um, the projects are prioritized, prioritized by a process that's outlined in a recent conservation strategy that came out just last year. It was published in 2018, though it had been in the works for about 15 years. So the four areas that we're working in are very different and diverse um, with our Mount Yulegged Frog projects. The Desolation Wilderness Lake Tahoe project, again, as fish were removed from lakes about 10 years ago, but no frogs had moved in to recolonize. So in 2014 to 2016, and again in 2019, we released 275 frogs that were reared at the zoo. We've had a rapture rate of less than 15%. And um, is that good? We're, we're still kind of debating. It's not as good as we'd like, but we are getting some valuable information. And the project is continuing through next year. We're also working in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. This is where fish removal from dozens of lakes increased populations, but then crashed due to BD. That's um, Vance Friedenberg's work was documenting that. Now we're currently salvaging tadpoles and froglets and rearing them. We've released about 350 frogs over the past few years and are rearing about 300 for release next year. In a totally different environment, we're working in Plumas National Forest. This is more of a stream system. It's at the northern edge of the range for this species and um, is a different clade than most of the other species that we're working with. And we've reared about 200 frogs and released them in the forest. We have um, a bunch of different projects that we're collaborating with there where we're working with looking at predation by snakes, movement along streams, and comparisons of success of the wild versus zoo reared offspring and adults. And about 30 of those animals had telemetry belts on them and were, have been monitored for the past couple of years. And then a newest project is in Yosemite National Park, where we're working in these really pristine habitats to restore populations that are extinct between persisting populations. And this is a new project that we can talk about at another time, it's a whole other talk, but we've released about 100 frogs um, this past year and we're rearing about 300 for release for next year. So the goal, again, is to bypass the metamorph loss to BD by captive rearing and immunizing to keep frogs on the landscape in these pristine habitats, making sure the animals stay out there where they can have a chance to reproduce and persist, and then also to reintroduce them in landscapes where they are extirpated, but because of all the mitigation, have an opportunity now to, re, to repopulate. Often we get the question of why are you not captive breeding? Um, we have the luxury of an existing genetically diverse population of adult frogs persisting on the landscape. And most of these persisting populations exist at low densities. So there's resistance to remove these thriving adults because they're doing well and they're, doing, they're existing and reproducing on the landscape. So we don't wanna take them out of there for captive breeding. Also there's genetic consequences of smaller populations and all those other things that other people have talked about in this series. Why not directly translocate adults? Um, adults generally use aquatic habitats such as streams to move between habitats and they can move considerable distances to recolonize on their own. And so if they have not already recolonized on their own, there again, there's reluctance to just move them into areas where there's an unknown site where they might be at risk from unknown rip, you know, predation or threats. And so there's also reluctance to do that. We know that frogs spend two to four years as tadpoles and have these long periods of time as low BD positive animals. And as they move into metamorphosis, their BD loads spike up, as you can see in this graph. So they pass over the threshold, often passing over the threshold of genomycosis at metamorphosis. So therefore, our collaborative group decided to focus on that life stage that would typically be lost as the focus of our Head Start efforts. And removal of 10 to 30 percent of tadpoles from a population has very little impact on that population that loses 90 to 99 percent of their tadpoles at metamorphosis. 
So looking back at our head starting graph from earlier and replacing it with yellow-legged frog eggs laid in the wild, giving you an idea, a mix of genetically unrelated tadpoles from a persisting site can be collected, reared at the zoo, and looking at these percentages, um, we can skip a lot of those threats that the animal would face when they're in the wild for those two to four years by hi not hibernating them during the tadpole phase and decreasing the time to get them back in the wild. And moving from lots of diverse eggs, if we collect 500, we would have about 365 juveniles and give us about 350 of the adults to go out in the wild from 500, which is obviously much better than the 1% that you might get in a wild population. So the process, um, working, focusing on desolation wilderness, that started in 2014. It's our longest running data set and it's a nice one to compare as we have all different life stages that we've brought in and can compare all the results pretty clearly. So eggs, tadpoles, and recent metamorphs would arrive at the zoo. Eggs are considered naive. Tadpoles are not treated for BD until they metamorph when we treat them with itraconazole. We swab the metamorphs after treatment to make sure that they're negative and oftentimes the metamorphs come up with about 100,000 zoospore count. So they're pretty, pretty heavily infected when they come in. Our goal is to create an adaptive immune response and we follow the same protocol as what Mary Toothman and the Briggs Lab did, except for that instead of using one strain, we're currently now using four strains of BD from the Sierras. And we, but we follow the same basic protocol. And this occurs about eight months after the tadpoles have come in, the eggs it would depend upon, you know, a year or so after the, they come in. So we follow the same procedures for the immunization here at the zoo. Um, the only thing is that we do have a true control group. We have about 30% that were controlled and our naive animals are the ones came from eggs. We expose some to BD, some to the sham and then treat with itronazole. And the same thing happens with the metamorphs. Now reminder that for the metamorphs, this is their second exposure. So it's more of a kind of a vaccination <laughs> type of thing with the immunization because we know they've already been exposed previously. And if you recall from the earlier experiment, you can see that the results of our zoo immunization, immunization frogs look very similar. So animals that were naive when they came in had very, very high loads when they were infected with BD in the lab and were way by that, um, way up there by the critical threshold. Whereas animals that came in as metamorphs or as tadpoles even, when they were infected, they had much lower BD loads and so they were considered more like persisting populations. And you can see that effect here where you look at a comparison of the loads across both the experimental projects and the field data, you see the same patterns. So this is really interesting because it gives us a lot more insight into sort of what happens. So we now have evidence that not only does the immune response remain without further BD exposure for up to a year, but it can also be generated during metamorphosis, which was sort of an unknown before. Mountain legged frogs have a robust immune response. And as long as BD loads don't reach those lethal levels before that response is created, obviously if they do and the animal dies, it doesn't matter to the frog. But if they can be treated before that, then their body has the ability to create an immune response. And this response is present in metamorphs. And though it may decay from full on response, it provides a long lived resistance to lethal loads, at least according to our data so far. And it's also really important to note that um, in this case, the infection of the animals that came in previously exposed or as metamorphs were potentially from a different strain of BD than what we infected them with. And so they can get resistance to BD, even if it's a different strain, but from the Sierras, at least as far as we know. Now our naive frogs did get very sick. And just to give you an idea of how sick some of them got, you can see from these pictures, many of them were borderline over the limit of chytridiomycosis. And we did have to treat some prior to the three weeks of infection. So one thing that was really critical was monitoring closely to maintain the um, the health of the animals and make sure their survival in the wild. So for one example, we had one individual that reached over 250,000 zoospore count during three weeks and um, was, was very ill but did survive once it was treated with itraconazole. So another thing to think about is that there are implications 
for releasing these animals and translocating or releasing um, Head Start animals. In an ongoing project in Yosemite National Park, um, Roland Knapp and his crew found evidence that even in the best situations, a good healthy habitat, individuals and lots of individuals, um, reestablishment takes a lot of time and also a little bit of luck. <laughs> um, after six years, after a translocation, his team found that um, even though there was a reduction in the population over time, a sudden recruitment success propelled the reintroduced population to establish and is now doing very well at this site. And coincidentally, this seemed to occur during drought years and shows that climate could have more of an impact than we considered in the past. You can see how the um, snow depth kind of coincides with this increase in the population at that site after maintaining kind of a low level. And so population establishment may depend on you know, rare pulses of recruitment, which is why it's so critical to keep these animals on the, on the landscape for as long as possible. And it can take over 10 years for populations to become reestablished. So assessing the success requires a long-term commitment of resources and um, may require additional animals to be introduced. And that's sort of what we're finding in our site in Tahoe as well, is the habitat is super complex and recapture rates have been very low, as I mentioned, less than 15%. But we are seeing subadults and tadpoles, and at least one egg mass was found this past summer at that site. So there is reason for hope and, and for continued optimism. There's a very high density of garter snakes at all of our sites, um, especially this site and at our Plumas site. And the telemetry project in Plumas has confirmed a high incident of predation from the telemetry frogs. So long-term assessment of reestablished populations is necessary. Um, and really important. As you can see on the map on the right, this is after one year, the frogs in one of our sites in Tahoe, they're all released at one location and have spread both around the lake to nearby lakes and up the tributaries of the streams that feed into the site. So they do move around quite a bit and can be very difficult in these large deep lakes to recapture. There's a lot of pros and cons, obviously, to this type of research. Um, our initial data shows that there is a benefit to the response, so why not do it if it can help? Or why not at least try to figure out if it can be helpful to part of the populations? Um, it provides one less variable for frogs to deal with, and we now know that we should focus on our naive populations for inoculations primarily, and so that's also very helpful because there are also cons. Um, deaths of individuals can occur sometimes. They have different responses, individuals, populations have different responses, and um, sometimes that is not necessarily the best outcome. There's a lot of time and staff challenges. It takes a lot of work to do this, a lot of disinfecting, and is very expensive. It's about $100 per frog to do the immunization. So there's a huge cost. And again, recapture rates, um, recapturing is very difficult. So, we're not done with disease, um, but just to move on to a different species, the California red-legged frogs. After several years of working with yellow-legged frogs and immunizing them, we began a project with the California red-legged frogs. Um, before our study, no one had measured the susceptibility response of frogs, red-legged frogs to the chytrid fungus in the wild. We know these frogs carry fungus spores, but generally don't die from the infection. So that led us to hypothesize, hypothesize that these frogs may have a natural immunity to the fungus due to the declines when BD was first arrived in the area and what we're seeing in museum specimens. We think that they were in fact a long time ago as a population and have evolved to coexist in BD positive environments. And so we began a study in 2016 to test this idea. Um, again, our goal is to test if there was an adaptive immune response by exposure. We followed the same protocol as we had and what Mary Toothman had previously. The only thing was that we repeated it with the same group and also with a second group and repeated it also the following year. So we kind of retested several times to make sure our data was correct. So to give you an idea, we used three groups. Um, we infected group one with the fungus and then treat, used the other two groups as controls and treated all the groups with itraconazole even if they weren't infected. And then we infected group one and group two a second time about 60 days later, sorry, 50 days later, and, and kept a control group and then treated all the frogs with itraconazole to eliminate that as a factor. And we found the following. Um, during the first infections of groups one and group two, 
both of those, um, so th this kind of shows you the x-axis across the weeks of the trial. And this was the treatment period where we treated both groups. And you can see that both groups became infected during week one. And then for group one, it increased a little bit during week two and eventually dropped down. And the same was seen with group two, only a little bit sooner they started to lose their infection. And eventually, most of them completely or mostly cleared their infection prior to treatment. So one of the things we want to mention is that group two, it was later on this season and it was a little bit warmer in the room. So that could have been a reason why um, that group lost their infection sooner. That's kind of the only outstanding factor. But they both show this decline um, prior to treatment. We infected only group two twice, but when we reinfected them, you can see that they, they basically did not get infected. Um, you can see that blue bar just barely goes over the line there, and then they dropped to basically not a readable infection prior to treatment. So in conclusion, we think that red-legged frogs can clear the fungus on their own, and they can also seem to develop an immune response even to that slight infection. And to put it in a different perspective, um, we take the previous graph and you look at sort of, <laughs> excuse me, um, where the threshold is for infection. Now this is a slightly different um, calibration on this graph because moving from zoospores to a different um, measurement tool basically divide this by 100. So 1 million of the ITS copies on this would be 10,000 zoospores and 2 million would be 20,000 zoospores. So you can sort of see the same thresholds of where we think the kind of point of no return is, is about a million on here or 10,000 zoospores. And these guys were way, way below that factor, um, way below the possibility of chytridomycosis starting. Again, signs of chytridin mortality. So again, way, way down below the threshold of the disease and we decided that we did not need to immunize, that they seem to have a, um, an ability to fight off the infection on their own. And that was great news for us because we didn't have to treat a thousand frogs for <laughs> BD um, and immunize them prior to release. So what does this mean for the future of frog conservation? We're hopeful that immunizing can be a tool to complement conservation for naive populations and also um, that persistent populations arriving as tadpoles or metamorphs, if we focus on that life stage, we don't need to treat them. And that's great. We still we still treat them when they first arrive. So we basically are immunizing them by treating them for the symptoms of chytrid at that point in time, but we don't need to do a second immunization. And so that saves a lot of money, a lot of staff time, and um, also is very beneficial for them because it's also less risk to them for dying. So moving on quickly to some behavior stuff that we're working on. Um, in order to release the frogs that are best able to deal with the uncertainty in nature, we're studying, we're studying behavior as well to understand how we can influence the development of the frogs during rearing. So we had a, a really nice opportunity to work with a large number of frogs that were all reared from eggs. And because we, we kind of had them from the very get-go, we were able to think about some questions like how can we achieve the goals of ensuring the smartest frogs were being released and making sure that we were giving them the best chance of survival post-release. So our behavior research focused on consistent individual trends over time, defining those trends as differences in behavioral types or, or basically personalities, essentially, is what we considered it. So using a hypothetical example to show variation in behavior types, you can see how much time individuals in a group of frogs might spend hiding. So most frogs spend some time hiding, some spend little or no time hiding, and we can smooth that data with a curve. If you look at the left side of the curve, you can see that um, nearly all these frogs spend very little time hiding, and we call these animals bold or exploratory. If you look at the right-hand side, these animals would be considered more shy. So in years that both individuals fare, most, time, most years, most individuals will fare well in the wild. But for example, if you have a year where you have a lot of bullfrogs or a lot of other predators like otters, um, for example, this happened in Yosemite National Park, both of these animals red -legged, are predators on red-legged frogs. So given 
a low predator environment, a bold frog that are released in the valley might have more mates during the breeding season, might acquire more food, might get bigger than their shy counterpart. But when these otters come in, like such as when we had a wildfire in the Yosemite area a couple of years ago, it pushed a lot of otters and other animals into the valley where they might have been in more surrounding backcountry. And we know that they started predating on amphibians. And snacking on frogs makes those bold frogs more apt to be predator food, whereas the shy frogs might fare better during those couple of years. So it's good to think about how to create a mix of those animals. A wide range of personalities is what will help in these un given uncertainty in the wild. So if you have a wide range of behavior types, some of that is determined by genetics, but some of it is also um, determined by the environment in which the animal develops. Obviously for us, environment is what we can control in the Head Start groups. And so we, and since we relocate animals in these artificial habitats while we raise them, we can kind of play with that a little bit and see if we can change their behavior and give them the best chance during certain years. We had to identify about 400 frogs <laughs> based on photo ID. So these guys were really small. They were too small for pit tagging. So we visually had to compare them. And so um, photo identification is not used as commonly as other invasive techniques, but um, because of their size, we found it to be a reliable technique for identifying frogs for months and months, and even across, um, uh, across the two years of the study. At the zoo, um, after metamorphosis, when the animals transitioned from tadpoles to frogs, we moved them to terrestrial habitats. And these were four enclosures with about 75 frogs each. And we varied the habitat complexity in each of the containers to see if that would adjust their behaviors to fill different niches or roles in the habitat. So in theory, if there were different niches, that would result in a greater range of behavioral types in possibly even within one enclosure. So some habitats had more hides or less and some had more or less water availability. Um, so to test the individual personalities, we moved frogs from their enclosures to a four by six foot novel test arena. And we randomly selected half of the frogs from each enclosure to test in these arenas. Um, they started off in these opaque enclosures with a little door and we placed the hide close to the center of the arena, removed the door. We left each frog in the arena for five minutes and then repeated the are arena trials three times with five weeks in between each. And this resulted in 456 videos and approximately 38 hours of data to review. It was um, a, lot of, a lot of video watching. But during those five minutes, we measured how long the frog stayed in, hide out of the, in the hide out of view, how long it sat in the entrance to the hide without leaving, and how it moved around outside the hide. If the frog stopped moving for 30 seconds, we recorded how long the frog sat in the open and how many lines it crossed. And we found that there was essentially no difference among the enclosures. Most frogs stayed in the hide for most of the trial, but some spent about 18% of their time sitting in the entrance or 17% moving outside the hide. A few frogs sat in the middle of the arena and when frogs left the hide, they moved about two feet. So finally, we can sum up the arena behavior to see if individuals have consistent behaviors across trials and create a model which calculates personality score for each frog, and then we can compare that score um, for each of the trials and across the trials. So our model showed that one score in particular matched our data well. We call this score boldness, and frogs that spend more time hiding have more negative values on the spectrum, while frogs that spend more, more time outside the hide have more positive values. So after running statistical tests, we found that our boldness scores were significant across trials, meaning that frogs were more bold in trial one, would also be more bold in trial two, and also in three, and vice versa. So essentially, boldness is consistent and is a measure of personality in these frogs. So now frogs spend less, uh, less time hiding and more time outside the hide as the trials progress, suggesting that they may be learning from their from their previous experiences. And the arena became not, no longer novel during the second and third trials. And that made us think that if they can learn and problem solve, they will fare better in the wild. So our next step is then to continue this project and analyze the rates at which the different 
animals in each of the different enclosures learn, learned. <coughs> now, due to massive fires in Yosemite area in the summer of 2018, our red-legged frogs were not released um, the year following these behavior trials. And so to take advantage of that, um, we continued the behavior experiments for another year and are currently evaluating about 400 additional hours of videotape and hoping to have updates um, soon. So we did release our final red-legged frog this past summer. We released over a thousand to Yosemite National Park. The disease monitoring is ongoing and um, there's an additional telemetry project to monitor movement and chytrid infections as well to see if the what we found in our our lab trials is actually what we're also seeing in the field. So there's going to be a lot more data to come out of this project, and I'm really excited to see how the two the two field and lab projects kind of um, coalesce into a, a long-term study. Bullfrog removals in other areas of Yosemite National Park are occurring, and we're hoping there's a possibility for more head starting in the future. So successes and challenges. Um, obviously, you know, BD is an ongoing challenge, but I think one of the exciting things is that we're learning that we can change our response as needed and not be formulaic in how we treat our frogs based on the experiences that we have looking at persisting populations and naive populations. Monitoring for release populations is expensive but important, and hopefully some of that additional funds can go to helping with those expenses. And Growing partnerships. We, you know, we're working in four areas across the range of Mount Yulega frogs, and you know, we're always looking at potential other projects that would be interesting and and join in. So there's a lot of potential for more partnerships and more zoos to come on board as well. In terms of the behavior work, I think thinking outside the box and making sure our frogs are ready for release has been really beneficial in how we look at the animals and and how we can enrich and stimulate them to encourage natural behaviors, as well as feeling confident that we're putting out animals that can survive whatever stochastic events or changes in the environment occur. There are a lot of challenges to this type of work. Um, deaths are not conclusive and it's often very frustrating, as many of you probably know, to not get a definitive, a definitive determination of the demise of an animal. Things are very expensive, so everything costs a lot, especially some of this BD research and of course the limitations on recaptures. But I have to say the benefits often outweigh those challenges. We get to collaborate with amazing partners and we have the opportunity to make a difference locally. And, you know, working with zoo personnel, park and forest staff, they're really some of the hardest and most dedicated people that I've had the opportunity to work with. And the support we've received from Fish and Wildlife and Cal Fish and Wildlife has been amazing. And we're so thankful for all of the funders who have um, assisted us. And I want to acknowledge some of those funders as well as all of the people who have participated in this ongoing research, especially Mary Toothman and Sherry, Sherry Briggs in her lab, Vance Riedenberg, Roland Knapp, Rob Grasso and Colleen and his staff, and as well as all of our zoo staff and interns. 